including this building, and there's another building right next to it on the same block near that old building in front of it. Three buildings on the same block, new buildings being built in a city. You know, the developers at first they're saying, uh, well, I don't want another building on the same block with me. Well, I said, well, you're in a city. You know, there's, you can have more than one building on a block. <laughs> and the, both of these buildings are over 30 stories, and they, they, uh, they're, neither one of them was subsidized. Uh, and, and that is something that Detroit needs to learn, because you don't, the city doesn't have a lot of money. The foundations do, and they, thank God they're investing in that streetcar line, Kresge and all that. That's a, about the best thing I've ever heard a big, rich foundation do, is to come in and build a piece of public works that uh, the Michigan DOT and, and Detroit probably never would have gotten around to doing without them doing it. And that, that's something they should be really proud of. But anyway, um, that Detroit doesn't have enough money to subsidize projects, so what they need to do is make the permitting process work and have a code that can be read and do good urbanism, and you don't need variances to do good urbanism. You need variances to do crappy stuff. If you want to drive through, if you want a surface parking lot, well, then you should have to get a variance. But uh, if you want to do good urbanism, you should get permits very fast. You know. Bad stuff, like uh, anti-urbanism stuff, that can take more time. But if somebody's following a, a good code, uh, then let them have it. All right, now I'm going to switch to back to modernism. I talked a little bit about how our movement gets juxtaposed with modernism. Now, I just want to make it clear. The, I admire the modernists, some more than others. But this one I admire greatly, Gropius. Walter Gropius was the... You know, the leader of the Bauhaus movement, he was one of the Berlin modernists, and he, uh, his anti-urbanism that developed, developed for an understandable reason. Uh, he experienced World War I, and World War I was the bloodiest thing that had ever happened up to that point. And the first machine gun war, mechanized killing, millions of people killed, and the really stupid leaders of the various empires blundering into a war that just wasted the wealth of Europe and ruined a lot of cities. It was a terrible thing. So the architecture of the of the empire, you know, Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire, the German Empire, French, British, whatever. Uh, that was not something the modernists really looked up to. So those beautiful things that we like when we go visit Paris and, and Germany and Vienna, the boulevards, the grand boulevards with the terminated vistas and all that, those were things that the modernists said, that's the, that's the architecture of the, the foolish imperialists. And so we're against that. We're on to the new world. In fact, he said, it's the end of history. You know, Francis Fukuyama, the conservative uh, uh, guy, uh, foreign policy expert, said that about after the communist empire fell in 1989, said it's the end of history, now it's the American era, that's it. You know, he now has retracted that attitude, but um, he said it in 1927. It's the end of history. It's the end of the history of architecture that the modernists had come up with the functional form the minimalism, you know, all that stuff, that was it. You didn't need any more. And the conceit of somebody who was triumphant, because they did take over the academy uh, in Europe, and they took over the academy. When he came to the United States in 1936, and very shortly thereafter was made the head of the Harvard School of Design, he changed the curriculum, he drove out all the classical Beaux-Arts stuff that had dominated at Harvard, uh, and after the war, that curriculum spread like a virus through all the architecture schools except Notre Dame, Andrews, and Miami, and maybe, Mark, you'd say here, I don't, I don't know. It definitely, it definitely went to Cranbrook. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so, so one of the things that they, they one of the things that Gropius wanted to get rid of was the terminated vista and which is kind of psychotic on his part because terminated vistas go back to the Greeks the Romans the 
Aztecs, you know, all the old civilizations had terminated vistas, but somehow he thought it was imperial. This is a village north of Milwaukee called Port Washington, about 29 miles north along Lake Michigan. And it has uh, St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church perfectly terminating the vista of the downtown village center. Uh, this was built out in the 1880s, 90s, and early 20th century um, from a pattern book from uh, Austrian Poland, from Krakow. So you, what's the main street in Krakow? Whatever it is. Anyway, the St. Mary's Church there, the same thing, only on a smaller scale here. Um, so they just did it by a pattern book and, and uh, created this beautiful scene. But um, this wasn't done in America, as far as I can tell. I have not been able to find an example of a consciously created terminated vista in the United States that's been built until late in the 1990s, except for two. There are two of them, and I'll show you one here. <laughs> This is in Orlando, and that's Sleeping Beauty's Castle, which almost perfectly lines up with the center lane. And it's the, you know, the main street with the retail on the first floor and Mickey and Minnie living above. Uh, and here's a drawing of a terminated vista from an Italian hill town. Sometimes a drawing is easier to see than the reality. Or the Chicago Board of Trade, which was finished in 1927, a couple years before the, they had that, they have the statue on top. They say if the market really, really, really someday crashes, that she'll dive off the top. Um, but this is a great setting. I love walking south on LaSalle with this beautiful, it's like an outdoor room. And all the real estate along that street benefits from this beautiful terminated vista. Um, it's wonderful. The Batman movie, one of the great scenes in the recent Batman movie with uh, Heath Ledger uh, was shot there. And this is in 17th century Holland, when Holland was the richest country in the world. And they had the... Uh, terminated vista here on a canal. So if they could do it in the 17th century, why can't we do it today? And the answer is, we can, and we are. But it's not coming from the architecture schools. Uh, the terminated vista is making a comeback because of developers and the big box retailers. Target doesn't want to be in enclosed malls anymore, but they do want to be on the T-intersection of any of these lifestyle centers that are being built. And I agree that, that if you think that that's not as beautiful as uh, the uh, canal shot in, this, in Amsterdam or the Chicago Board of Trade, it's a little bit crude. But it is making a comeback, and it has, and it will come back, and there will be things that are much more uh, beautiful than that. And the photograph, I couldn't find it, but the Calatrava in Milwaukee lines up perfectly with the center lane because Calatrava is an urbanist, but he's not, um, he's not in lockstep with the modernist thing about not having terminated vistas. Now, the other great modernist than Gropius, these two guys, Gropius and Corbusier were the two most prominent leaders. And Corbusier made this drawing in 1922 uh, the city of tomorrow. Um, if you translate it correctly, I mean it's contemporary, but actually it means the city of tomorrow. Je parle français parfaitement. No, I not really. But anyway, the uh, the what he did here was take the street from its three traditional purposes that it has in a street in the city and go and dumb it down from the three purposes down to just the movement of vehicles. Gets the pesky pedestrians out of the way. Uh, and this, you know, just look at this drawing, 1922. It looks like a suburban office park on steroids, and it's 1922. It's got the steel and glass buildings. I mean, it's a brilliant drawing. It, it was predictive uh, of what would happen in the United States. 
In fact, prescriptive because the codes require it. You know, like this is Crystal City, Virginia, that's near the Reagan National Airport. It is Corbusier's City of Tomorrow. There it is. You can't walk on that street. You can't sell anything. Uh, it's just for movement of vehicles, although now they're going to fix it and turn it into a boulevard. And there's Corbusier. And it's seductive. You know, the way he looked, the furniture he liked, uh, the the designs of buildings that he made, um, the glasses he wore. You go to the Harvard School of Design, and about 20% of the students there have glasses exactly like that. <laughs> they still love him. They worship him. Another modernist who had a huge influence, particularly on road design, Oscar Niemeyer, uh, who's uh, from Brazil, but lives in Paris. And Oscar, uh, actually a very beautiful building in Paris, the, maybe the most beautiful modernist building in Paris is the Communist Party headquarters, the French Communist Party headquarters. So if you go to Paris, go look at it. It, it looks like a suburban office part building, but it's strikingly beautiful because it's surrounded by the old French uh, built landscape. Uh, anyway, he did Brasilia which is a utopian city, the capital of Brazil. They moved it from Rio, one of the great cities to be in in the world, uh, and put the government there. And uh, all the streets are grade separated. You know, all the major streets are grade separated. That's what the, the pedestrian gets to see in Brasilia. It's the sterile, most sterile city you can imagine. And you have to go to the edge of the city. This is New Orleans, but I'm just, you have to go to the edge of Brasilia to find a decent restaurant or to find any nightlife because the city is so dreadfully dead. So the utopian notion of driving through a city without having to stop at a stoplight, you know, this dream turns out to be a nightmare because it wasn't, it was a specialty, a special narrow view of the world put into place by somebody that was arguably progressive. I mean, a communist, you know, it was supposed to be for the people. You know, land for the peasants, food for the people, peace for everyone. That was Lenin's uh, great slogan. But, uh, and it is, the peace of the grave. All you have to go to Brasilia, you can see it. Um, okay, so these ideas were metastasized and then brought to the U.S. And Robert Moses, who's famous for all the freeways that he had and built and didn't build in New York because of Jane Jacobs. But he moved around a lot. He did the freeway system in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, he did the freeway uh, system for New Orleans. And one of them was the Claiborne. This is Claiborne Avenue in um, 1947. And Louis Armstrong lived along there. It was sort of the upper middle class black Creole neighborhood. Uh, it had like a couple hundred businesses over a three mile length and these live oaks in the middle. Big, what they call neutral ground, the median. Uh, and then in 1966 they removed the live oaks and they put in the freeway and uh, the freeway covered Claiborne Avenue, and the businesses closed, almost all of them are gone today. And uh, that's the circle at where St. Bernard Avenue and Claiborne Avenue came together, and uh, that was covered with the freeway. And our plan is, and along with the Treme Neighborhood Association and various other allies, including the new mayor, Mitch Landrew, um, is to remove the freeway and put the avenue back. And it's gaining popularity. And it's so much to work, fun to work on this project because the, one of the people on our, one of the, the women on the committee for tearing down the freeway had a party at her house and uh, Wynton Marsalis didn't show up, but his dad did. And if you've seen that TV show, Treme, the guy that played the trombone or tr tr 
tuba or whatever it was. He was killed on the, in the show, but he showed up. It was like a ghost. This guy shows up who I'd seen on TV. Anyway, it's fun working with all these New Orleans celebrities, and it's, the project just keeps gaining more support, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to restore the great Claiborne Avenue and the circle where St. Bernard Avenue comes in. Uh, but let's talk about Detroit and what happened to Detroit. I mentioned earlier that it was the most successful city in the world in World War II. It did more to produce supplies than any other city. This is Woodward Avenue in downtown Detroit in uh, uh, the spring of 1946. Uh, we won the war. U.S. won. Germany lost. Japan lost. Detroit's triumphant. Three department stores. Kearns, Crowley's, Hudson's. Hudson's was the second largest department store in the world. Detroit's uh, pushing up toward two million people. Um, and then they started on their project to fight traffic congestion. And I've heard people say that you can't build your way out of congestion. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, the Michigan DOT figured out how to do it. And um, they built, there's, I think that's the Lodge Freeway, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway, and that's the uh, Hudson's when it was blown up and torn down because the market had disappeared for it. They built all the freeways, took out the 300 and some miles of streetcar. The last streetcar was gone in 56. Um, and so uh, this is Berlin in 1945 in May at the very end of the war. Uh, about 70% of the buildings in the central districts like Prenzlauerberg and Mitte, and if you're familiar with Berlin, were destroyed. Um, Here's Berlin uh, at uh, the biggest intersection in Berlin, Potsdamer Platz, in 1989, before the wall came down. Uh, but even then, uh, both East and West Berlin had been rebuilt. East Berlin, not as nicely. They're, they had the, those stacked apartment buildings called uh, Plattenbau. Or Plattenbau. Uh, a lot of them are being torn down now because they were so uh, low quality. But um, the West had rebuilt everything. The East had rebuilt some good things. And uh, anyway, here's Potsdamer Platz today. It's totally restored and now has the biggest railway station in Europe underneath the street there. Um, there's no war damage in Berlin at all, except for stuff they've kept on purpose, like the Kaiser Dome uh, Cathedral, which uh, had the top blown off by the bombing. Uh, they've kept that just to remind the Germans w what they did. Um, and, you know, the Germans did some pretty nasty stuff in World War II. Uh, Rotterdam, two days after the, the Dutch had already surrendered, they bombed it for two days until it was flattened. And then they took these aerial photographs and then made sure they got handed out in Paris. Uh, so that the Parisians could understand what would happen to them uh, if they didn't surrender. Uh, and this is Warsaw, which uh, Hitler ordered all the buildings torn down. I was there in December and stayed at the Bristol Hotel, which was one of the few buildings that wasn't torn down because the German general staff was staying there, so they didn't get around to tearing it down. It was a beautiful hotel. But, you know, Warsaw was built back, pretty much built back. It was built back before the communists even left. Even they built it back. That's Old Town. All those buildings were built during the communist era, maybe reluctantly, under pressure from the people. But uh, that's the Old Town Square. Uh, but Detroit, most successful city in the world, we won World War II, the Germans lost, but it looks sort of like maybe we lost. If you didn't know anything about history and you come and you see Detroit, what happened? You know, think about it. Who won the war? And uh, 
you know, we need to do something about it. It was bad public policy. You can say, well, it was an auto city. What do you expect? Torino, Italy is an auto city. That's where Fiat. Fiat's shut down almost all their operations there. You go to Torino, it's beautiful. Streetcars are there. There's no freeways built through the middle of Torino. It's a beautiful city. It's a complicated city with lots of different things in the economy. Uh, people want to live in Torino. And the same is true, uh, Volgograd is the big vehicle building city in, uh, in Russia, it used to be Stalingrad, it was flattened during the war. It's all built back, it's not as nice as, as uh, the Western European cities. It's got some of that Soviet style architecture and everything, but it's all built back. But here we are, empty. Is it because people didn't spend enough money, government money in Detroit? No, they spent it on the wrong stuff. Freeways, which don't belong in cities, it's a rural form, it doesn't belong in the city, it reduces the value of the city, it reduces the value of the whole metropolitan area. The cities that don't have freeways have really rich suburbs. Vancouver has no freeways whatsoever, and the suburbs around Vancouver are rich. Vancouver's rich, and the traffic distributes beautifully. They're not trying to conquer congestion. They're trying to distribute their traffic in a way that adds value to the community. In Detroit, and it's not just Detroit, Milwaukee, everywhere else, the, the, the idea was to conquer congestion, that the purpose of the city is to move vehicles, and all the other purposes of the city are secondary. And that was really stupid. And it ought to stop, but it doesn't stop. We still we have people saying, we need to invest more money in infrastructure. No, they never want to, but they're not going to raise taxes. They're going to borrow more money to do it. You, know, you have the stimulus bill where you have people actually who believe in doing the right things, and the stimulus bill still ends up paying for highways that are destructive of cities in many cases, not everything. Some of the stuff in the stimulus bill was good. Um, but anyway, we need, to, we need to attack that idea and change it. Infrastructure should add value in the places where it is built. When you're talking about a city, if you put infrastructure in a city, it ought to add value. If, you're not gonna, if it's not going to add value to that city, then don't build it there. So anyway, the freeways, the good thing about them is that, like anything, they have a life, uh, uh, the, uh, a life cycle, and it's about 40 years long, sometimes 50, sometimes less. Uh, this freeway, the West Side Highway in New York, was built in the late 20s and early 30s, and it fell down in 1973, fell down again in 1975, uh, and it was replaced with a street, an ordinary street, West Street. It's Sure, it's got uh, three moving lanes in each direction, so it's a little big for my taste, but it moves the traffic fine, and it opened up the uh, view of the Hudson River to the real estate, so Tribeca, which was a slum, uh, my sister used to live there when it was a slum, and Chelsea and Battery Park. Those are all beautiful neighborhoods today, high-value uh, neighborhoods. The Embarcadero uh, was hit by the earthquake and damaged in 89, removed. They put the boulevard back that was there before, and the property values bounced back. There's more than 10,000 new units of housing there, including some that's affordable. Uh, Another example is in Seoul, South Korea. Right after the Korean War, the United States government built this freeway right through the middle of Seoul on top of the uh, river that ran through Seoul. And uh, the guy who became mayor in 2001, Myung Bak Lee, didn't like that. He hated it. And when he became mayor, he got rid of it. Uh, and so they tore out the freeway, put in street on each side, two lanes, in each direction, surface street. They didn't try to accommodate the capacity of the freeway, which was like 140, 150,000 cars a day, because the street grid is so complex and rich, it could absorb all that traffic. And so uh, that's the way it is now. I mean, billions of dollars of real estate in downtown Seoul. Sure, they built a new transit line as part of it, so that absorbs some of the congestion. There's the mayor who's now the president of South Korea, look how happy he is. <laughs> See, if you do something really smart and courageous and you know it, and you go out there and 
and you can celebrate it, take your shoes off and enjoy it, and then get elected president of South Korea, and that's probably a miserable job by comparison. Okay, so let's talk about, sometimes it's easier to un understand things if you get away from your own city and see another one that's done things that are equally um, mindless. Buffalo, the great city of Buffalo, the only city in America that ever had their mayor elected president of the United States. That was Grover Cleveland. I don't know if he was named after Cleveland or whatever, but <laughs> anyway. Um, but Buffalo was a very wealthy city at the turn of the century. That is between the 19th century and the 20th century. Uh, and then in the post-World War II period, Robert Moses visited Buffalo and was hired to do a freeway plan. They already had a really good traffic distribution system. They had commuter rail, they had huge vast streetcar system, they had um, boulevards, multi-way boulevards that had been designed by Olmsted that were in place and Moses didn't think that was good enough. So he did this freeway plan which covered two of the boulevards with sunken freeways. So they dug the boulevard out and hauled it away and built a freeway and also covered the waterfront with concrete. The it's on Lake Erie, beautiful Lake Erie, it was Buffalo, and the entire waterfront from Lackawanna to Tonawanda is separated from the city by freeways. And the, the one to the south only carries about 30,000 cars a day. And in Lackawanna, it's just a, a, a boulevard, just a four-lane boulevard. Uh, but it had to be a freeway in Buffalo. So it's, it separated the city from its greatest asset, the lake. 